episode on the cultural contributions of the Guptas. In our last episode, we had looked at the social conditions prevailing during Gupta rule. We had also looked at the education, literature, theatre and religion of the time. In this episode, we shall focus on the art, architecture, sculpture, painting and music of the Gupta period. When we speak of cultural contributions, we must remember that two important things need to be taken into consideration for his growth and development. These are leisure time and money. The Gupta kings had both. After their initial battles for acquisition or the subjugation of a number of small kingdoms around their territory, the rest of the advancements were not really wars but expeditions to show their might. Thus the Gupta kings were able to patronize artists and intellectuals during the high noon of their reign. The Gupta period marked a watershed in Indian culture. Gupta art is characterized by restraint combined with a great sense of beauty and discipline. The artists in the Gupta era excelled in architecture, sculpture, painting and music. Even the coins issued during this era could be termed as pieces of art. The Guptas were well known for their coins, but coins as such existed much before the Gupta period. Gold coins were first introduced in the Gupta period by Chandragupta I. The Gupta kings minted these coins. Prior to Guptas, the coins seemed to have been somehow hammered into existence, but with the Guptas it attained the status of art of the second order. Chandragupta I gazes into the face of his queen, Kumara Devi. Samudra Gupta seated on a throne. Chandragupta II slices the rhino. Kumara Gupta I rides on an elephant. Coins reflect the lives of the rulers. Terracotta refers to artistic objects that are made from terra, meaning earth or mud. They are basically two types. One, almost two-dimensional figures sketched on soft clay plugs and then fired, and the other, three-dimensional figures. After being fired, plugs were probably covered with plaster and painted in bright hues. It is important to study terracotta because here we see not only the artifacts left by kings, but that of the poor man as well. Nearly every archaeological site from Harappa onwards has produced many terracotta objects. Terracotta reliefs were employed in architectural panels from the end of the Kushana period and early in the Gupta period. Terracotta reached its highest technical perfection during this period marked by a superfine clay body that allowed for smoothly modeled surfaces and refined features. A touch of the Gandhara school, where reproduction of reality was considered of the highest standard, can be seen in some of the early Gupta terracotta works.
plastic arts and architecture depend greatly on religion because they derive their material from religious traditions, customs and beliefs. During the Gupta period, a number of religions had thrived, providing a mine of material for sculptors and painters. Most of the architectural remains that have come down to us from ancient times are temples, other religious places and palaces. The common man's dwellings hardly survive the onslaught of nature and time. Therefore, when historians speak of architecture of a period, it is mainly religious places and palaces. In the Gupta period, in architecture, as in many other fields, many experiments had been made, many innovations had been added. Prior to the Gupta period, architecture of India, much of the architecture of India does not exist because it was made of wood or other perishable materials. It is in the Gupta period that we find that both brick and stone architecture came up and use of brick as an element in architecture is the first is seen for the first time in the Gupta period. Between the Harappan brick structures and the fragments of Mauryan wooden decorated pillars, all we find are the stupas. Stupas are large hemispherical domes containing a small central chamber in which the relics of the Buddha are placed in a casket. The core of the stupa is of unburnt brick and the outer face is of burnt brick covered with a thick layer of plaster. The stupa is covered with an umbrella of wood or stone, a wooden fence enclosing a path for the ceremonial circumambulation surrounds it. This is considered to be a form of respect paid to the relic within. The stupa is conceived as a microcosm of the entire universe. Emperor Ashoka built several of them all over India. The Guptas spent a lot of energy and wealth in enlarging the older stupas. The chief among them are the ones at Barhut, Sanchi and Amaravati. Temple architecture was a new innovation which was added in this period, in the Gupta period, the religious innovation was the rise of personal gods and the relationship between the deity and the devotee was very, very intimate. To represent that intimacy, Gupta temples had a small Garvagriha and it was very small, not as enormous as the Chaitya in a cave. And these temples were built of bricks. Sometimes they had terracotta uh, decorations in the exterior. And we have come across two such temples, that is the Devga temple and the uh, Bhitargao temple. The Devga temple has both brick and stone and plenty of terracotta, but the Bhitargao temple is the only brick temple, only brick temple, which has come down to us from the Gupta period, although they are in a very bad state of decay. Use of terracotta had been a special forte of Indian architecture. Experiments had been made from the Harappa period and as time went on, there were more additions to the terracotta tradition. We find this terracotta tradition reaching a very great height in the Gupta period and they were used profusely in the decoration of the temples. One thing which has to be remembered, the Gupta period was, an, was a period of experimentation so far as uh, temple architecture were concerned because the uh, artists and the masons were not yet used to this kind of architecture. So we find that the process of experimentation which was started in the Gupta period that was carried on for a very long time, for millennia in the history of India. And these temples have 
had images inside and the ropes were inevitably flat. And there were very strict norms regarding the building of the temple. The Shilpa, just in, the lit, uh, in drama we have the uh, Natya Shastra, in architecture we also have the Shilpa Shastra or the art of uh, construction and beautification because architecture is both the science and art of structure of building and therefore the tradition that great tradition which was started by the Guptas is one of the marvels in the history of Indian architecture. As in the field of architecture, also in the field of sculpture, the Gupta period was a period of many experiments, of many innovations, of development of the styles and the schools of art already existing. We know that in the Kushana period, sculpture had reached very great heights as exemplified in the Gandhara school of art and the Mathura school of art. But as Again, we know that the foreign influence, the Greco-Roman influence was very strong in the Gandhara art to some extent on Mathura school of art also. But in the Gupta period, we find that a gradual indigenization, a gradual um, enrichment of the process which had started uh, earlier had reached their culmination. Buddhistic religion had played a very, very important role in the evolution of the Gupta art. And one thing which we have to remember that in literature, the work was done by the elite. It was the uh, social elite or the intellectual elite who had, uh, had been responsible for the literary works in the Gupta period. But these masons, you know, they did not come from the literate circles of society. They are very close to the soil. They are the autochthonous people. So we find that it was very natural. And in the depiction of the moods and images, we find that indigenous and this uh, emotions close to the soil, close to the soil of the land, that was exemplified in the Gupta period. And we find that more importance in the Gupta art was given to the, not to the form. Of course, the form reached its, uh, form was very perfect in the Gupta period, but the inner expression was very important. And that is why the Bodhisattva images that we find in the Gupta period, they are so immensely well known in the world. Apart from that, we have sculptural relief work on the temple walls. Cave architecture, cave sculpture, relief work was also not given up totally in the Gupta period. But we find that the emerging deity of the Gupta period is Vishnu. The great source of information, uh, inspiration is Vishnu. Uh, the Bhagavata and Shiva, both are very important. But as I said, the overwhelming figure of the Gupta sculpture is Buddha. And Jainism is also not lost to this cultural tradition as well. And we find the great uh, Gomateshwara, the Gomateshwara image or the statue of Gomateshwara in what is Karnataka today that is found. And Gomateshwara, he is, the, 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 the sculpture is very robust. We find that Bahubali is again represented as a human being who is aspiring for reaching greater heights in life. And we find that he is so engrossed in his meditation that plants, creepers have grown covering his uh, feet, coming up to his knee. And this also shows that he is half embedded in this earthly world and he is 
kind trying to come out of that and reach new heights in salvation. There must have been paintings in the earlier period, but made because they were made on perishable materials with uh, perishable, perishable items that have not come down to us. And you know this whole new uh, history of the Gupta painting was revealed when the Ajanta caves were discovered by accident in the earlier part of the 19th century. Just as in the sculpture, we find the great source of inspiration in painting is the life and teachings of the Buddha and most of the stories are derived from the Jatakas and the Pitakas. The Jatakas and the Sutta Pitaka plays a very important role. Uh, it was uh, the most important reserve of inspiration for the artist. You know, we have 28 odd caves in the Ajanta region and many of these caves well, the walls of these caves, sometimes the ceilings of these caves are beautifully decorated with the paintings. And although uh, the Ajanta caves do not fall in the territory which directly was ruled by the Guptas and much of it was in the Vakataka territory, but as I had told you earlier that all the different forms that developed in the Gupta period, they developed in this period between 300 AD and 800 AD had been labeled as Gupta. So, in that way, the Ajanta paintings also belong to the Gupta period and there was of course, or there's almost a rediscovery of the Buddha and it does not only tell us about the many lives of the Buddha, the different phases through which the, the, the Buddha's life evolved, Buddha's teachings evolved. They had been immortally depicted in the Ajanta paintings, their fresco paintings. As we know that fresco is one of the very important forms of arts of painting, the technique of painting where you know the wall had been, had to be prepared earlier uh, with plaster and when the plaster was still wet, these paintings were made and one is uh, very much amazed by the variety of colors, the vibrancy of the colors which had been used in these paintings. And it is also very amazing to know that uh, most of the materials were locally produced and locally obtained, although certain things like the lapis lazuli, the, 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 the bright lapis lazuli or the um, turquoise, they were imported from outside. And Definitely the traders of the long distance trade, they got these items for, uh, from where the artist got his materials. So it also shows the uh, great development of trade because most of these caves are in an area which were very much vital for commercial interest. Vatsayan has referred to 64 colors which were prevalent during this time. Many women were trained in these arts and crafts. Certain aspects of music were quite popular, such as Swaragatam, that is knowledge of the seven Swaras, Vadyam, that is playing on musical instruments, Pushkaragatam, that is skill in playing a particular instrument called the Pushka, which was a kind of drum, and Samatalam, that is the knowledge of beating rhythm to music. Some of the Gupta kings were patrons of music, while others were great musicians themselves. The Allahabad stone pillar inscription of Samudra Gupta claims that he could excel even Narada and Tumburu in his musical excellence. This evidence is corroborated by the lyrics type to the coins of Samudra Gupta, which showed that he was an excellent musician. Kumara Gupta I also issued such coins as imply a lute performance. The Bhitari stone pillar inscription of Skanda Gupta describes the emperor as being well versed in different musical tunes. In these two programs, we have discussed 
the immense contribution of the Guptas in every aspect of culture, be it art, architecture, sculpture, music, painting, religion, and even theater. This brings us back to the original question, that is, can we regard the Gupta age to be a golden age in Indian history? Professor Shen Gupta, given the immense contribution made by the Gupta rulers in various aspects of culture, is it justified calling the Gupta age a golden age in Indian history? Well, this has been one of the older notions in the writing of history, when in the colonial period, you know, the psychological hurt that was inflicted on the people of India by the so-called inferior British culture and also this constant reference to the great Elizabethan age or the great Periclean age or the great Augustan age. You know, the nationalist historians, they also wanted to locate a golden period in the distant past somewhere in this history, in their history. So therefore, the obvious choice was the Gupta period which had reached great heights in many fields which we have already overviewed. But these golden age, dark age notions are, are the discarded notions of history, modern history writing. In definitely, so far as uh, many of the excellence which the Gupta period had reached was not matched by some of the objective situations. And the disparity which we find in the social circles, that is the disparity between men and women, the position of women in the Gupta period, we have seen that many of the vices of the society had penetrated and had been established, institutionalized in the Gupta period. You know, sati had come in, child marriage has come in, denial of education, higher education, not only higher education, even ordinary education to women had been uh, one of the uh, features of the Gupta period. So when half of the society was segregated, the Parda was coming in, uh, half of the society was segregated, we cannot say that this was an ideal society. Then and of course, Prabhavati Gupta is rather an exception than the rule. She is the lone figure that we find and for that instance, you know, sometimes we see that the royalties, royal women, they are being figured in the coins. They are also being mentioned in the inscriptions, but they do not have much individual role to play. These were matrimonial alliances for, new, for strategic interest, for obviously commercial interest, for territorial interests. The cultural excellence that we find, that was to a great extent an urban phenomenon or it was the elite who devised them, who executed them for their own personal self, on their for, or for, or for their own glory, for their to, for, as symbols of their own power. And the common people in the villages, they were not much touched by the so-called uh, notions of the golden age or the elements of the golden age. And of course, their slavery was not there in the European sense of the term in the Gupta period. Slavery was not there. But you know, there was definitely bonded labor. We have heard of Vistis. There was definitely the depressed classes. And how can you call a society egalitarian when there is so many, so much of caste system? And therefore, this golden age concept is, uh, is no, no, it is not irrelevant. It is, uh, so modern historians would not use that kind of definition as a label for the Gupta age, but the Gupta period is definitely one of the great periods of history in the sense that it set the norms which the later generations followed and that way it would be, a, as Romila Thapar had pointed yes. out, you know, it would be a much better uh, idea to call it the classical age, age of Indian classical. history, the classical age of Indian history. We thus come to the conclusion that in spite of the immense contribution made by the Gupta rulers, we still cannot use the term golden age to describe this particular dynasty. But nonetheless, it remains important that the Gupta period, which ruled for almost 300 years in India, is one of the most vital periods in the history of the Indian subcontinent.